Good evening. Welcome to the Sound Engraver stream, the Monday night stream. I am your host, Sound Engraver, or hostess, Sound Engraver. Hopefully you are doing well tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking about art, some more art. We're going to be talking about Dada, a very famous art movement and philosophy, I might add. Um, I have a little bit of a different format here. Um, I uh, The computer's lower. So on, on the one hand, I kind of feel hunched. Um, so I'm trying to tilt it up just so I have a little bit of headspace. Um, I just I just feel like the, the computer's sitting too high on my workstation. It's, it's great for when I'm working on my, my software and all that, but um, I, I needed to bring it forward. So hopefully the format looks good or, or the look of it looks fine. Um, the light looks different. I feel like it's darker, but we'll just go ahead and roll with this uh, for now and uh, get right to it. So let's go ahead and welcome the chat. We have a few people here and and, and Prof did confirm that I look and sound great. So that's good. Um, so let's go ahead and welcome the chat. We've got Go Team Ghost Planet, which is a, a you know, from 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 far away, the, the avatar looks really, really good. So welcome. We are both in the house. Well, nice to see you both, you and your son. And um, yeah, I see that you've done some upgrading on the channel. Good. And uh, we've got Daniel Heron as well. Hello, awesome people. Hello, awesome Daniel Heron. And of course, my wonderful, handsome intellectual, Professor Geek himself, who, who says my beautiful, which is extra nice, I shall say. And then we have Big Al with his new machine, which means actually he probably can stay on my stream for the whole time. That'd be pretty interesting. I don't know if I'll talk about, you know, what I had for dinner, but um, <laughs> I hope you're on for the whole time, Al. Um, and I hope you're enjoying the new machine. I, I call computers machines. I've always I've always used that word for computers. Um, I don't know. I just, I, I feel good about that, that choice of words. But computers fine too. And then we have Green Line Girl. And I have been wondering about you. I've been, um, I think a couple days Back maybe a week or so ago, I was trying to see if you were doing any of um, any more Final Fantasy streams. <laughs> um, I just had been away and and I had kind of lost track on your your gaming stuff. So I hope you're doing your weekly streams as well. Uh, if you're doing something like Final Fantasy or another uh, RPG or JRPG, I'd be interested in seeing that. Um, but uh, yeah, hopefully you are doing swell yourself. And um, yes, yes, you're welcome. Uh, go team, ghost planet, go. Oh, wait a second. Oh, okay. I'm I'm seeing two two channels. Go team, ghost planet. Um, I just I just want to say, be careful. Uh, actually, I did want to say too. Um, sometimes it's Walton. Hey there, nice to see you. Good to see an, a fellow artist. Um, team ghost. Uh, I have noticed it, I have I have noticed that your your comments on your videos have been uh, disappearing uh, not your videos, my videos. your comments have been disappearing on my my videos. Um, that's happened to me too. Um, sometimes on another channel, my comments don't show up. Um, so I, I don't know if it's just from all the upgrades you've been doing. Um, but I, I'm glad you're here with me tonight on the stream. So, uh, yeah, I, I, sometimes, I don't know why some, sometimes my comments on other people's channels get removed. Um, but whatever, <laughs> I, I guess, you know, our beloved platform here doesn't like me talking about how art is objective because it really, it does ruffle up some feathers. Um, all right. And so we've got Wolf 10 in and then we've got, I think that's everyone. Uh, we'll probably have some more people filter in. I was trying to do nine o'clock again today, um, but I, the, the day kind of went by and I had realized I hadn't practiced the violin and I do have a Saturday gig over at a vineyard uh, in a in a tasting room, a wine tasting room, which which will be nice. I hope it's a good gig. Um, so that's Saturday and I, I, I have to build up my stamina again to play two hours straight, you know, without a break. So I'm like, oh, okay, well, I won't, I won't do nine o'clock. I'll do 9.30 today. So again, watch out for nine or nine 30 with my streams, depending on what's going on with my schedule. Um, so, 
uh, let's see how everything is working here. YouTube looks fine. All right. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move this tab here. I'm just switching tabs here. Okay. All right. Uh, I think without further ado, we'll just go ahead and and get started talking about the movement data. It'll just be an overview talking about the the philosophy behind data. Maybe just a tiny bit of history. Uh, what I had learned in my my music classes as as both an undergrad and graduate student, I really learned about data mostly. I hear myself through the headphones. Uh, mostly um, through my graduate studies in Milwaukee. Um, so we'll talk about the overview and there are just a lot of artists um, set in this website I'm about to show you, um, but we're probably going to cover about four or five, at least the four or five that I learned as, as a music student. So, you know, if you're an artist, again, always, always good to uh, brush up on some art history, always good to understand where, um, where these philosophies are coming from. So, if you guys, and I'm sure you you have felt this way before with your favorite popular art, but if you've ever felt like today's popular art or today's treatment of your favorite franchises more or less mock you to some degree, that is not a new phenomena. As I have said time and time again, this is at least 100 years old, at least at the start and reaction of World War One, it can you know it, it's deba it's debatable if it's started before World War One, but World War One and the reaction the, the the social reaction of the First World War is really what has instigated and propagated art that is meant to mock art, art that is meant to mock people. Art that is meant to mock the, the 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 common man, or really not even so much the common man in a poor way, uh, but more the middle class or the working class, um, the the bourgeois, bourgeoisie, as as it were, um, back in the early 1900s. So the the philosophy of mocking art and and being sardonic and and expressing are in a rather cynical and sardonic way as, as you know, pointing the finger and, and poking fun of people that that's been established, you know, definitely since World War One uh, and getting into the uh, reaction of the aftermath of World War One and especially, you know, getting into you know, things like the Great Depression and the modern art times and, and getting into postmodernism and, and all of that. So the philosophy is there. It's, it's, it's definitely a huge part of history. So yeah, as a recap before I start, if, if, if there's ever been a time in your popular art, in, in, in recent treatment of popular art, if there's ever been a time where you, you say, ah, I feel like they're making fun of me or I feel like they're mocking me. Well, that actually not... Be my, that might not be a, a far-fetched idea. Um, there have been artists out there in the last 100 years that have actually effectively, intentionally made fun of people uh, through their own art and their own anti-art expression. So making fun of art, people, and the world at large. <laughs> so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I will go ahead and share the the screen here oh actually i just realized yeah yeah there we are yeah we're going to talk about data just had to make sure i was on the right page okay i forgot to share share screen data movement overview <laughs> all right how does that look looks good on my end. So I'll just kind of read, I'll, I'll start with quotes, you know, 10 quotes here, and um, we'll get into the summary and I'll, I'll share my ideas. If you guys have any ideas of what you think of this movement, just let me know. We'll also talk about a few signature pieces and four or five uh, artists that were part of this movement. So as you can see here, uh, Dada started in 1916 and 
it looks like it ended around 1924, so definitely after World War I, but uh, kind of prolonged into the, the aftermath of what the first war, you know, the first great war or the great war <laughs> caused. Um, so yeah, a period of about eight years roughly, but the philosophies have just, you know, taken hold and, and it, it's commonly expressed throughout the 20th century. So let's get, let's go ahead and uh, start with these quotes. Oh, and actually, if you see this picture here, um, a little bit of a collage where you've got random squares on a square. Um, you've got some, you know, surrealistic depiction of, of people, you know, of the grotesque, um, you know, disproportional, weirdly shaped people. Um, also Mona Lisa with, with the famous uh, mustache uh, goatee you know, saying, you know, just kind of laughing at convention and laughing at uh, traditional um, pedagogy of how you produce art and, and laughing at the traditional view of aesthetics. So let's go ahead and start with these quotes. And some of these art artist signatures, um, I, I can't even recognize, <laughs> um, but let's go ahead and proceed. Dada, and, and notice it's Dada, D-A-D-A, -D -A, all capitalized. Um, it is from um, a word that is supposed to depict uh, something nonsensical. So sometimes Dada actually is all in all caps. Dada, as for it, it smells of nothing. It is nothing, nothing, nothing. Um, uh, Francis, uh, but, oh gosh, I had his name pronounced in my head. Uh, Picabia, I think his name is pronounced. Francis Picabia. I'm going to say that uh, quote again by Francis Picabia. Dada, as for it, it smells of nothing. It is nothing, nothing, nothing. So that is quite thematic of Dada. It's meant to be nothing. It's meant to be insignificant. It's meant not to have any real inherent meaning. The history of art is a parody of the history of politics. Uh, that is a Dada maxim. I feel sorry for nonsense because up to now it has so seldom been artistically molded. I think this is Kurt Schwitters who I will talk about a little bit in a little bit. I'm going to skip that one because it involves a word I don't want to say. <laughs> the beginnings of Dada were not the beginnings of art but of disgust. Words emerge, shoulders of words, legs, arms, hands of words. Ah, oh, ah. Uh. One shouldn't let too many words out. A line of poetry is a chance to get rid of all the filth that clings to this accursed language. As if put there by stockbrokers, hands, hands worn smooth by coins. I want the word where it ends and begins. Dada is the heart of words. So uh, this is Hugo Ball's manifesto or part of it. it. It might be completely his whole complete manifesto, but it might be part of it. I, I'm not sure. Uh, and he's also an artist that I will be reviewing. Um, this this idea that um, the, the middle class or the white collar culture um, is, is a bit of a stain, you know, the, the idea of, of smooth lines, of aesthetics, of, of cleanly pressed clothes, of, of, of order, of organization is supposed to be scoffed at among the Dada artists and, and the process of creating Dada art. So, so words, words like stockbrokers, you know, words like um, you know, something that does involve the white collar class or the upper class or the middle class, the, the bourgeois or bourgeoisie. We attempted perfection. We wanted an object to be without flaw. So we cut the papers with a razor, pasted them down meticulously, but it buckled and was ruined. That is why we decided to tear pre-wrinkled paper so that in the finished work of art, oh, so that in the finished work of art, imperfection would be an integral part, as if at birth, death were built in. So this need, this yearning to have a complete piece of art that is imperfect, that, that it has to be full of flaws. And not even masterpieces are perfect, but but the, the idea is saying we don't want 
something without flaw. We we want to perfect the imperfect. The imperfect. Um, that that was a huge sentiment for Dada and also other um, art movements. Another quote by Hugo Ball. Hugo Ball. Every word that is spoken and sung here, the cabaret Voltaire, represents at least this one thing, that this humiliating age has not succeeded in winning our respect. So this humiliating age is the age of war, the great war, the, the catastrophic aftermath of what the war caused, you know, um, from, from bureaucratic decisions to, to nations colliding. Um, so they are... The, 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 art, the artists of this time, you know, between 1916 and, and, and getting into the end of the 1920s, uh, they really expressed disdain for the order of things because they had faced their nations, all their nations and all their cultures faced the Great War. So I can understand this being a kind of reaction. It's, it's reactionary art that, that Dada is supposed to be. Now, I wonder if this sounds familiar to you guys. Dada is like your hopes, nothing. Like your paradise, nothing. Like your idols, nothing. Like your heroes, nothing. Like your artists, nothing. Like your religions, nothing. So they're, they're trying to make Dada an analogous to everything that is important in your life, but they're equating it with nothing. So again, that theme of nothing plays out. I speak only of myself, um, excuse me. This is um, uh, Tristan Sara, I think is how you pronounce the name, Dada Manifesto 1918. I speak only of myself since I do not wish to convince. I have no right to drag others into my river. I oblige no one to follow me and everyone practices his art in his own way. Well, that's, that's a little bit more open-minded. But again, I think it was, you know, it's, it's the idea of being open-minded against the idea of having a narrow view, a narrow perspective on what art should be. <clears throat> and I think that is the end of the quotes. So let's go ahead and um, I'll, I'll read the summary of Dada and then maybe, you know, go back to the chat, see what you guys are up to, what you guys are thinking. And then... Um, talk about some signature works and then talk about some artists and we'll have more of a discussion. See, see if any of these sentiments or these philosophies sound familiar. <clears throat> Summary of Dada. Dada was an artistic and literary movement that began in Zurich, Switzerland. Zurich, I think is how you pronounce the city. I know it's a popular city. I don't know how to pronounce it. It arose as a reaction to World War I and the nationalism that many thought had led to the war. Influenced by other avant-garde movements, cubism, futurism, constructivism, and expressionism, its output was widely diverse, ranging from performance art to poetry, to photography, sculpture, painting, and collage. Dada's aesthetics marked by its mockery of materialistic and nationalistic attitudes, proved a powerful influence on artists in many cities, including Berlin, Hanover, is that how you, Hanover? I don't know how to pronounce that. Paris, New York, Cologne, all of which generated their own groups. The movement dissipated with the establishment of surrealism, but the ideas it gave rise to, um, but the ideas it gave rise to have become the cornerstones. I don't know if that's, let me read that sentence again. Um, the movement dissipated from the established, uh, the, the establishment of surrealism, but the ideas it gave rise to have become the cornerstone of various categories of modern and contemporary art. That was a hard uh, sentence to say. Uh, so it, it's coming from movements that were already previously explored like cubism and futurism and expressionism. Um, but now it's really even beyond surrealism or, or the cerebral or the, the stuff out of the it or the stuff out of the, the, the um, subconsciousness and unconsciousness. Um, Dadaism and Dada is really supposed to 
not have anything mean anything else. It's, it's supposed to be strictly nonsensical. Whereas surrealism, I feel like, oh, well, that that is very abstract. That is very absurd. But I get it. That could be that could be a part of someone's dream. Or I, I get the the color, you know, the, the coloring here and the shapes here. I, I can understand that, even though that is really uh, abstract or even disturbing. I'll go down to the key ideas and accomplishments and then I'll go back into the chat. So the first note for keys, uh, key ideas and accomplishments, Dada was the direct antecedent to the conceptual art movement, where the focus of the artists was not on crafting aesthetically pleasing objects, but on making works that often upended bourgeois sensibilities, and that generated difficult questions about society, the role of the artist, and the purpose of art. So it was really, you know, as, as the Great War pretty much turned everything upside down as far as culture and, and, and architecture and structure and, and, and economy and, and, and morale, uh, th this was a reaction through, through the artist saying, well, because, you know, because this war has done this, you know, it actually caused a lot of artists to be very, very cynical. It's like, well, why don't we express the same way, and, you know, in, in the same manner as as the Great War did to society? We're going to use art, kind of like a, you know, so that something that is analogous to the Great War to to um, put everything topsy turvy, and and to really make people uh, guess what art should be or guess how society should act, and 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 generate some. Um, you know, questions on, on perspective. Now they, I've never lived through a great war. <laughs> I've never lived through any of the, uh, you know, um, you know, the first two world wars, of course. So I, I don't know what it's like. I, I can't really blame cynicism on these artists because they, they went through the horrors, not me. Now I think, I hope under the pressure of a world war, I would hope to turn to what is good and uplifting. I really wouldn't want to poke fun and, and be um, sarcastic and sardonic to beautiful, beautiful things like like objects and and inspiring things like like a work of art. But that was the the, the general reaction of Dada is just to to poke fun of society to to really blame society for its materialism and to blame um, bureaucracy and and kind of I think they I don't think they separated materialism with bureaucracy which I I say is understandable but I think the two can be separated as well I'm not saying I'm not <laughs> I'm not condoning either but um but I but I would say I, materialism is one thing it, it's 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 a societal weakness and bureaucracy is also um, societal weakness that is linked to, you know, the elite or the government. So that's, that's the first key uh, idea. Uh, the second is, so intent were members of Dada on opposing all norms of bourgeois culture that the group was barely in favor of itself. Dada is anti-Dada, they often cried. The group's founding in the Cabaret Voltaire in Zurich was appropriate. The Cabaret was named after the 18th century French satirist. Uh, I think that's how you say it. Satire, satirist? Is that how you say that occupation? Voltaire, whose novella Candide mocked the um, uh, idiocies of his society. As Hugo Ball, one of the founders of both the Cabaret and Dada wrote, this is our Candide against the times. So it's, it's a reaction against the times. It's, it's a reaction to blame bureaucracy and materialism for, you know, what happened with the war. It was, it was to shake you. It was to shake society. Third bullet point, artists like Hans Arp were intent on incorporating chance into the creation of works of art. We talked about chance music or chance art, aleatoric art before in the previous weeks. This went against all norms of traditional art production, whereby a work was meticulously planned and completed. The introduction of chance was a way for Dadaists to challenge artistic norms and to question the role of the artist in the artistic process. We talked about that the previous week, um, both with Fluxus and then also um, with, with, with the happenings, that, that performance art form where the role of the artist was no longer important. It was, it was really forfeited because it's not about the end product is not about the result, it's about the creative process. So in, in all the flaws and all the mistakes and, and all the 
you know, ugly are, are out there. Well, that's, that, that shouldn't, um, that wasn't actually really relevant because it wasn't about boosting up the, the artist or, or, or lifting them up on a pedestal. I get it. But I, I also do believe the the artist is important. But again, this is the result of reacting to the Great War. So last point is Dada artists are known for their use of ready-mades, everyday objects that could be brought and presented as art with little manipulation by the artist. The use of the ready-made forced questions about artistic creativity and the very definition of art and its purpose in see in society. Now, again, I want to be very mindful because th this mindset, this, this line of thinking was in the 1920s, a very different social climate than what we have now. You know, in, in the United States and in, in the Western world, yes, we are facing a lot of social upheaval and we will continue to face it, but not on the catastrophic level uh, of the, the, the two world wars. And so, uh, I would say with that, I want to be very mindful with what I'm about to say next. But but this philosophy here, the use of the ready-made forced questions about artistic creativity and the very definition of art and its purpose in society. Uh, I, I would just say, as I've said previous weeks, that this is where I would philosophically disagree. Um, I, I don't suppose the forced questions about what artistic creativity is, is really necessary at least anymore i think this all all this philosophy is reactionary i i still think that artistic creativity is um is about the process of course but it is for the artist you know as far as the artist is concerned their their role is to produce something that inspires society that um inspires morale that inspires legacy that inspires craftsmanship that inspires excellence that is what i do believe the role of the artist should be and i would remain fixed in my position regardless of what's happening in the outside world so even if we faced another world war i would hope that my position and my view on what art is and and what the artist should do and what the role of the artist is i i would hope that that is not changed just because the the world that that the, the circumstance of the world has changed as well. So I want to be very gracious in, in saying I, I disagree with this idea like, oh, we got to force people to think how art should be. And, you know, we got to we got to force we got to shake people and 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 redefine what art is. Well, I'm gonna, I want to say that with grace because that mindset can really naturally come from such a catastrophic event like the, the First World War. So that's what I have to say about that. Let me stop uh, the screen share for a second and get into the chat. All right. I see a few new people. I see uh, Evie and I see Zetopia. Good to see you. And uh, Dr. Y with his somewhat, yeah, that's a good joke. Dada is the worst parent ever. Yeah, I think I, I think your comment, I think you posted a little early, so the comment, your first comment was gone. But it's good to see you, by the way. Um, I think it was like, Dada, what about Mama? I was like, I, I haven't seen Mama Art. <laughs> okay, bye, Wolf 10. I'll miss you. Um, all right. Yeah, actually, um, I agree with uh, Go Team Ghost Planet. Art is supposed to be everlasting and and uh, immortal uh, to outlive the artist. Uh, it is the artist's legacy, and and I agree. And you know, people would would kind of counter me and, and say, well, that that's that's egotism. You know, that's narcissism. And I, I would say, no, no. I th I think you can, as I said last week, you can have, you can have a very healthy ego and still produce very, very good art. I mean, I've seen very humble performers. I've seen very humble performers who are very good on their musical instrument. You can be humble and still be the best of the best. It, it's it's not an impossibility. And and so I would, I would caution against artists who would say, 
well, um, you, you shouldn't think it's so important for the artist to have um, their work outlive them because that's that that's that's an example of narcissism. It's it's not. I would say actually, it'd be narcissistic just to live in the moment, and 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 say, well, I'm just going to enjoy this moment, and I'm going to produce a piece of art uh, just for this night, just for this night only, and and no one can experience it except those who attend my concert that night and and pay me fifteen dollars a ticket. No, I'm not. I'm not against going to a show like that. I'm I'm not against going to a, a spontaneous show where I I listen to and behold art that no one else will listen to for the remainder of their lives <laughs> because it's different every night, like like in the, in the way of the happening. But it's um it's a it's a weird link, you know. People link this this idea where it's like it's this kind of strange causation where it's like oh, you want your art to live forever. So that's narcissism. It's well, it's like not if you separate yourself from your art, you know, it's sure your signature is on your art piece, but people actually newsflash, they don't really think about the artist. They think about the art. Now there are exceptions. There are Tolkien scholars, you know, there are, um, th there are people who have written about the life of J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, so there's an exception there, but at the same time, like when we read Lord of the Rings, we're, we're reading Lord of the Rings. We're not really thinking about Tolkien himself, unless there's a bit of context and what is said in the story, what's written down in the story and maybe his life or, or how, how he, how his story can apply to our lives. That's, that's pretty much as, as close as it comes. Evie asks a question. Yes, actually, yeah, you ask a question, then you raise a really good point. Um, it is, is it possible to make art that is topical and indelible? So when you say topical, are you talking about something that is contemporary, something that is of today, whether it's like a current issue or something? Oh, I think so. I think so. Um, I would say the art that lasts forever is the art that embodies the universal truths. So like um, like a sculpture of a, of a famous philosopher, you know, not only is the, the sculpture ar artistically done and, and well crafted, you know, and because it, it's that, it's gonna, it's going to remain for, for however long. Um, you know, the, the art museum will have it or the cathedral will have it, but, you know, also it, it, it embodies a, a really good representation of who the previous philosopher was, was. So it has kind of like a dual meaning, like, okay, this is, this is a very good sculpture of this philosopher. And then there is meaning behind, um, the, this, like, who was the philosopher? What did this philosopher represent? What did, what did they say? What did they argue? And this is not trying to get all political, but this is actually why the, the removal of statues is not a good thing because it, it does embody a representation of, of a kind of truth, maybe not the whole truth, maybe not the whole story, but a kind of representation of a person or an idea. And also statues are well done. It's kind of a dig. I, I, I you know, I, you know, when people, again, I don't want to be, be, be too political, but I don't think people are seeing the side of, of the story of, of, of statues being torn down on a whim, by the way. Um, they, they see the side of like, oh, that, that rep represents something reprehensible. We got to take it down. Not realizing it takes a lot of man hours and practice hours and, and time and dedication to even create a statue of, of, of that look, or, you know, it's like, it, it, it takes a long time for sculptures uh, or to be made and, and sculptors to learn their craft. It's like, you know, like if I, I mean, I don't make physical art, so I, I don't think I'll have this, this problem, but, oh, you know, like, let's say like if, if my, my music were, to be problematic somehow. Instrumental music, I don't think it could ever be pro problematic, but I did write a faith-based song. So because my faith-based song is, is Christian and it's based on a lot of text and, you know, the book of Psalms and stuff. Well, if that's, let, let's say that that song gets picked up everywhere, like on Spotify and stuff like that. And then 
that because it's a faith-based song, it's, it's problematic and it's taken down. It's like that, that took me months to not only compose and write the song, but also m- months to produce and, and to get it mastered and to record because I did sing it. So, you know, people who was like just on a whim, they, you know, they, they tear down a statue, whatever the statue is, just, just doesn't matter. It's like that, that was a lot of work that artist did. <laughs> That's a lot of time and, and, and attention and, and dedication and, and, and it, it comes down in, in a matter of seconds. It's crazy. It's crazy. They don't even think about the artist and how much work they put into that statue. Um, so Evie, I hope that answered your question. Um, art can be topical in, in the contemporary setting uh, of, of a current issue or something. Um, but I think rather than focus on a topical issue, I would focus on a universal issue that can surround a, a contemporary topic. And when you when the artist focuses on universal truths and fundamentals like function and form and aesthetics, that everyone, no matter where they are um, in, in whatever part of the world, they, they, they can latch on to and say, oh, that, that makes more sense. I think that's what causes the, the art to be timeless. And your second point is, uh, I don't think it's narcissism if the art takes front and center over the artist. That's exactly... That's exactly right. You know, I I would love to compose a masterpiece, you know, electronic music, just a, a masterpiece of an album of electronic music. Or I'd love, I would love to compose a masterpiece out of my my space opera, you know, the science fiction that I'm working on. But it's not it's not about me, you know. It's a it's about the space opera. It's about the story, or it's about the electronic music. It's about what that piece of music can do for another person. Yeah, it's got my signature on it, but it's 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 not about me. And 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 it's, it's it is important for artists not to insert themselves completely into their art, like uh, that recent example of um, uh, whoever that comic book writer writer. Uh, I don't know her name, but um, for I am not Starfire, like that was that was. I don't know much about the comic news, comic book news, or DC news, but I know that that was a total self insert. <laughs> so, <clears throat> all right, a few more uh, reading of the comments, and then we'll go into some signature pieces. Uh, Go Team Ghost, uh, Planet Ghost says, The Art of Jack, uh, The King Kirby, uh, Steve uh, Ditko. Oh, oh, Jack Kirby. Oh, Jack the King. Okay, that's that's a reference. Okay. <laughs> Steve Ditko, uh, Bob Kane, and and um, Bill Finger, I think. Jerry Robertson. I don't know these names, so hopefully I'm reading them correctly. And well, I, know, I know Jack Kirby. Uh, and Joe... Jerry and Joe created Superman and Alex Ross. I think Ross, I think you're meant to say, um, are everlasting. Yeah. Yeah. That, that Evie said topic as in current. Yeah. Topical as in current. Yeah. I, I would, I would, um, my recommendation for artists who want to explore that is to make something analogous to the, to the topic at hand. So rather than a specific incident or a specific news story, make something that ha- has the same parallels that ha- has the same um uh this, the same frame if, if that makes sense dr y says it's a testament to these art movements oh it, it uh, it's a testament that they are hardly remembered but conventional art has always endured inspired them i know it's pretty pretty interesting isn't it because as impactful as Dada was during that time, it it is it is ephemeral. You don't have artists normally create out of Dada concepts, unless unless a certain artist is a professor at a university, or the artist is commissioned to do something for an exhibition. 
I can, th those are the two scenarios where I think, you know, Dada would have that influence in, in contemporary art today. Final Fantasy Fan 12 says, I do have three albums I recommend you listen if you are into rock music. I'm sort of into rock music, depends on the, the rock style. Uh, they are um, Heart of an Artist, Dawn of the Demetrix, and Goliath's Throne. They are all part of a series called Iris. Is that like dark fantasy or something? Oh, Alex. Oh, t okay. Alex Toth created Space Ghost. Okay. Is that, is that true? Let me, I gotta, I gotta look that up. And then we'll go back to the art because I, I don't want to get too off, too off topic. Okay. I can't, I can't find him right now. Um, yeah, that's okay. That's okay. All right. And then Evie, we'll, we'll conclude with Evie before I get back into the screen share. Uh, so it would need to be a universal truth found in that current topic that an art piece might show. I understand. Thanks for answering. I hope so. Yeah, I'm glad. I, I'm I'm glad that that um, clear things up for you. Awesome. All right. Let's go ahead and look at some signature pieces. So I'm going to go ahead and share. Let me make sure I'm on the right page. Yeah, actually, I'm I'm still on the right page. And forgive me. Sometimes on stream, guys, I I can't pronounce names correctly. I'll, I'll have it pronounced in my head before the stream. And then there's, there's sometimes you have little mind blocks that that prevent you from pronouncing cities or, or names. So um, there are a lot of different names of these European artists. So bear with me. All right. All right. Looking good, looking good. All right, important art and artists of Dada. And these are just three, I believe. Uh, Isi, say Steiglitz. Here, this is Steiglitz, 1915. Artist by the name of Francis Picabia, I think is how you pronounce his surname. Picabia was a French artist who embraced the many ideas of Dadaism and defined some himself. He very much enjoyed going against convention and redefining himself to work in, a, in new ways a number of times over a career that spanned over 45 years. At first, he worked closely with Alfred Steiglitz, I hope I'm saying his name correctly, um, who gave him his first one-man show in New York City. But later, he criticized Steiglitz. Um, as is evident in this portrait of the gallerist as a bellows camera, an, automo an automobile gear shift, a brake lever, and the word IDEAL in all caps above the camera in Gothic lettering. The fact that the camera is broken and the gear shift is in neutral has been thought to symbolize Steglitz as warm as worn out, while the contrasting uh, de um, decorative Gothic wording uh, refers to the outdated art of the past. The drawing is one of a series of um, mecha uh, mechanistic portraits and imagery created by Picabia that ironically do not celebrate modernity or progress, but like similar mechanis um, mechanistic works by Duchamp, show that such subject matter could provide an alternative to traditional artistic symbolism. That was a little bit of a wordy paragraph, so I hopefully, you know, hopefully I read that clearly. <laughs> um, and I'd like to touch on uh, this last bit here. Uh, like similar mechanistic works by Duchamp, uh, this shows that the subject matter that the subject matter could provide an alternative to traditional artistic symbolism. Um, it, it did for, for many decades in the 20th century, um, and it still does in, in contemporary art sections of an ex exhibition or, or strictly, strictly contemporary art exhibition. Um, as for being an, it being an alternative, I, I would say 
now is debatable. If if the artist is trying to get out into the world and and release to the world their their art. Very strange though that um that that an artist would collaborate with another artist and then believe him to be stale and then do kind of an abstract self-portrait that that involve uh, you know gear shift from an automobile and a um, a camera and and that I, I just find that a little little fascinating so that was 1915. yeah I wonder what uh, the artist Steiglitz thought of that all right this is a pretty important one um, reciting the sound poem Karawani or it's either Karawani or Karawane and I did learn this uh, in graduate studies. Uh, this was composed in 1916 by the artist Hugo Ball. And you can see this image here. And, and actually it will be described in this paragraph here. Um, and, and that was also my uh, thumbnail uh, where th this man here is, is dressed somewhat uh, absurdly. So let's go ahead and, and read about this piece by Hugo Ball. Ball designed this costume for his performance of the sound poem Karawani, in which nonsensical syllables uttered in patterns created rhythm and emotion, but nothing resembling any known language. The resulting lack of sense was meant to reference the inability of European powers to solve their diplomatic problems through the use of rational discussion, thus leading to World War I. So again, a reactionary art piece. Equating the political situation to the biblical episode of the Tower of Babel. Ball's strange costume is meant to further distance him from his audience and his everyday surroundings, making his speech even more foreign and exotic. Ball described his costume. My legs were in a cylinder of shiny blue cardboard, which came up to my hips so that I looked like an obelisk. Over it, I wore a huge coat cut out of cardboard, scarlet, scarlet on the inside and gold on the outside. It was fastened at the neck in such a way that I could give the impression of wing-like movement by raising and lowering my elbows. I also wore a high blue and white striped witch doctor's hat. And you can, you can see how his, his costume here is quite tall, makes him look a little otherworldly. Now, a sound poem is um, a poem that is all about the sound, not syntax, not semantics, not the meaning of the word. Um, it's all about the phonemes. It's all about the, 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 the construction of a word or maybe the permutation of, of, of the different letters and, you know, vowels and, and the, the phonemes there. Uh, so it, it was all about how things sounded and it was supposed to represent the the nonsensical the things that don't make sense the things that don't have any inherent meaning and it, it's very fascinating that this was the reaction his reaction um he, he wanted to display what he believed was bureaucratic discussion and and political discussion and um i mean i kind of I think that that that, that could be <laughs> reenacted uh, in these times, maybe not so much with uh, the, the elites in the government, maybe, maybe, I don't know. I would say more so probably with, uh, with media, with, with the elite media that we have today. Um, so I, I find that pretty interesting. And actually sound poems are pretty fascinating. I did, a, I looked over a lot of sound poems as, as a vocalist. I, I used my voice as a graduate student instead of my violin because I did have my violin stolen at the last year of my undergrad. And so I didn't have a violin for two years. I was actually without playing or practicing for two years. And um, so my primary instrument during that time was was my voice. And so I, I did explore a lot of uh, sound poetry. Um, Jacques Blanc is is living and famous. And I, <laughs> I bought a book of his, of his sound poetry for like $60. They told me, he was like, oh, you should buy it. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity and he he's visited and and he's not that famous i mean he's sort of famous um his book was 60 dollars. i think i lost it too and it was it was about the the guttural and the and the syllabic um um 
syllabic, you know, with syllables, but it was also about um, mouth sounds and saliva. You know, it was supposed to be gross sounding, like his tone poetry, not the tone poetry, um, his uh, uh, sound poems rather, uh, were supposed to be really just nothing but, you know, mouth sounds and moving the mouth in kind of grotesque, unconventional ways. Really strange. He would be a good contemporary example of Dada. <clears throat> and finally, Untitled. Squares arranged according to the laws of chance, 1917. So chance art was really happening during World War I, not so much the 60s, it was much earlier. The artist is Hans Arp. Hans Arp made a series of collages based on chance where he would stand above a sheet of paper, dropping squares of contrasting colored paper on the larger sheets surface and then gluing the squares wherever they fell onto the page. The resulting arrangement could then provoke a more visceral reaction like the fortune telling from I Ching coins that interested Arp and perhaps provide a further creative spur. Apparently this technique arose when Arp became frustrated by the attempts to compose a more formal uh, to compose more formal geometric arrangements. Arp's chance collages have come to represent Dada's aim to be anti-art and their interest in accident as a way uh, to challenge traditional art production techniques. The lack of artistic control represented in this work would also become a defining element of surrealism. And, <clears throat> excuse me, as that group tried to find paths into the unconscious whereby intellectual control on cre creativity was undermined. So again, this is this is the sentiment. This is the general sentiment of this movement. It was the general sen sentiment of Fluxus where you needed to re relinquish creative control. It wasn't about you. It wasn't about how good you were. It wasn't about how excellent your art could be. It was about going to the, the subliminal. It was about going to your id, you know, that, that, that unconscious. It was supposed to, it was supposed to just be a stream of consciousness and, and, and random happenstances, you know? Um, again, I, I would say, well, I mean, that's, it's interesting. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's an interesting idea. It's interesting in theory, but I would say as, as you guys have been pointing out in the stream that, that, that the art that is preserved is the art that is done well. And relinquishing control is a very important trait it's a very important parameter. Uh, it's it's a it's an important parameter to put in your creative process, especially as me as a composer working in in, in, in a software like Super Collider. I I really do leave things to chance or or leave things to the unknown. But with my sounds I draw from Super Collider, I'm also selective in what I keep. I'm also selective in what I put in my my digital audio workstation. So after I'm done creating sounds in Super Collider, then I'll just put it in Logic and, and, and see what happens there. And then I work with what they would say conventional technique. I, I do compose the, the, the conventional ideas like harmony and bass and melodic lines and percussion, rhythm and all that. So I, I, I don't, I, I would like to say that I, I, I don't ignore chance completely. I do love and deterministic composing, but I'm also selective in the output. I'm, I'm also selective in the result. I, I do not relinquish my creative control. One reason I don't is because it takes years to master this kind of intuition, not intuition, um, uh, invention, uh, method, I would say, you know, the, your practice as an artist, it takes years to get a process down to begin with. So to leave it to chance and to leave it without any intellectualism, I would say, well, I, I could have done that before studying all these years. I could have done that without paying $40,000 for my education. I, I could have done that without any teaching. It, it's kind of amazing that the professors really do encourage this um, withdraw, uh, withdrawal from intellectualism. It's like, well, but I could have done that without going to school. <laughs> I could have done that without paying you guys for your tenured positions, you know, 
Um, I, I don't say that like with any resentment, it, it, but I do find that curious that, that that's really what's encouraged by uh, professors. Now, I would say, yes, I love incorporating chants in my in my music, but that's the, the chance is not the result. Uh, the chance does, um, l- let, me, let me rephrase that. The chance is built in the, the creative process and then I am selective and I do control what is the output, the final product in my music. So, so, so that, that's an interesting um, uh, sentiment, you know, regarding artists like Hans Arp to, to do uh, chance work or aleatoric work because they, they want to break the convention of what art is. It, but just this antithesis or, or just this um, antipathy toward uh, the intellect or, or the cerebral or the, the years of practices is very fascinating. But I think, again, it, it stems from this is the result of bureaucracy. This is the result of um, failed diplomacy. This is the result of a, a, a war that has just been unleashed on this world. So I, I get it. I, I get that this is the the reaction. All right, let's get back into the chat and then um, talk about maybe four or five artists, and then we'll then we'll uh, go you know wrap wrap things up here. <laughs> oh yeah, that, that that that's a that's a good comparison. He looks like a space alien priest. He kind of looks like uh that that picture reminds me of something from Outer Limits, you know, that old science fiction show. Um that's that's what that reminds me of. <clears throat> Evie says, that's terrible. It must have been really hard to be without your violin. Don't know what I'd do if I uh, had nothing to draw or paint with. It, it was actually a pretty uh, tragic story. Um, I I was being careless. Someone someone knew where I kept my violin and they they broke right in. Uh, unless, unless they just picked randomly these locked locations. But I think someone knew I had stashed um, my, my my violin in a in it was really a locker. I should have just kept my violin the whole time. I, I, that was a really irresponsible thing for me to do as a college student, not have my violin with me. But, but most college students, at least at the music school, they just, they just kept their, they, they kept their um, instruments in, in these lockers and, and, and the cellos and, and, the, you know, the trombones and, and, and the trumpets, I think they had nicer lockers and I should have just had a more secure locker. Um, but yeah, it was taken. Um, I, I saw the, 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 the the manipulating and, and um unlocking the, the 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 latch of the the lock um and i i called all you know all the pawn shops i even called the police and and it was tragic because actually that was my that was the first violin i owned you know my mom bought it my mom bought it for me the day my grandfather died so it was it was really meaningful violin to me because it was I think my grandfather died when I was 13 and I got I got that violin my, my first violin to have not to rent but to have and it was actually <laughs> to this day it's it's my most expensive um I mean it's under 3,000 but I, ha- I have not had a violin above 2,500 appraised and and so uh it was it was, it was pretty pretty unfortunate but uh but that's all in the past. And, you know, we, we have to continue moving forward. But yeah, I didn't, I didn't practice. I didn't practice the violin for two years. Like, so the whole time I was a a graduate student, I I concentrated on my voice instead. But then in Little Rock, I, I got a, I got a violin and, um, and loved it. And it has a crack on it now. So I have another violin. (laughs) so um elijah brown welcome i don't know about the id so the id is is well i would say professor geek has a much better description and and synopsis of of what this is uh, or summary i should say uh the id is you know the collective tears 
I, I believe it's when I think of it, I actually do think of the unconscious, the deepest part of your psychology. But I also, at least to me, and, and you can correct me, Prof, if I'm wrong, I, I link the id with the, the tears of the of the conscious, the the preconscious, the subconscious, and the unconscious. And so, so really, the 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 deep, you know, um, iceberg that is not seen by the by the boaters, you know, that really deep, like like the the, the there, there's a great picture I've seen, like of, of a, an, an iceberg. You know how on the surface an iceberg is looks huge, but you don't realize just how huge it is in, until you see underwater. And so the iceberg underwater is much bigger. It's on a massive scale, and that's that's your it. That's that's the unconscious and subconscious, and and you can you can draw from your uh, subconscious. Um, uh, but, but really the unconscious is, is, is what you've repressed, like the desires or the fears or the stuff you don't like about you, uh, that you're trying to repress, that you're trying to get rid of, you know, the, 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 the gnarly part of your psychology. If I have that right, Prof, I could be, I could be totally mistaken there, but that's, that's what the, that's what I mean by the id. But I, I know the prof would have a better definition for the id, if if I am mistaken. <clears throat> yes, it was Evie. I, the cracked the cracked violin was very well used. <laughs> I just have to find the money to to you know get it fixed and then back together. All right, let's go ahead and and cover four or five artists, um, and then we'll go back to the chat and wrap it up. So hopefully this is somewhat insightful for you artists. Yay! My prof validated me. That's a good brief definition. It's a deep and complex topic. I find that kind of thing so, so fascinating. All right, let's talk about some artists. I will go, um, I will go ahead and switch my pages here. <clears throat> oh. That's not what I wanted. I need to go back to the, the Dada movement page. There we are. Okay. All right. See that again? Yes, we do. Okay, so here on the right-hand margin, you see the key artists of the Dada movement. Um, and actually, you can see more here. And I'll just go ahead and, and click view all. Um, you know, again, the artstory.org is, is, looks like a really good reference of, of timelines and concepts and synopses of certain philosophies and, and elements here, um, including artists and, and their works. Um, so we'll start with, um, actually, I kind of want to start with Mar Marcel Duchamp. And then maybe Francis um, uh, Picavia. And then also down here, you see a lot of people. Um, I do want to briefly cover Raul Hausman and Hugo Ball and um, Kurt Schwitters. Th those are the people that I learned um, in my graduate studies. I do remember them a little bit, uh, but you can see that there's just a handful of these people. So, all right. Let's start with really the, the man who... I would say, if not started, definitely instigated. He was the impetus for um, concept art, or, or not concept art, uh, conceptual art. Marcel Duchamp, French painter and sculptor, uh, born in 1887 and died in 1968. And uh, yes, what you see behind his uh, portrait there, his illustrated portrait, is, is a urinal. It is true. He is very famous for that piece and, and the idea of ready maids. So uh, let's uh, let's read some of his quotes. I, I did forget about this. Um, we'll read some of his quotes here, and then I'll just uh, we'll go over the summary. I don't necessarily endorse the the, the opinions of Duchamp. You cannot define, he says, you cannot define electricity. The same can be said of art. It is a kind of inner current in a human being or something which needs no definition. 
I would say, well, no, you actually can define electricity. I'm no scientist. I'm no electric electrician. Um, but we have a lot of science um, and elements of causation that causes electricity. So yes, you can define electricity. You can define its form and you can define its function. Um, so that's a very, uh, I would say, nebulous comparison, you know, comparing electricity to art. And, and, and he, yeah, he was born in the 1800s. Um, but, but I would, I would say even in his time, electricity could, could be defined, especially, I mean, he died in the 60s. So I don't know when this quote was made. Um, but I, th I think he's, I, I'm speculating, but it kind of sounds like it's, it's tongue in cheek. Maybe he's dead serious. I'm not sure. But, um, you know, the, the idea that something which needs no definition, art needs no definition. And to that, I would say this is why I have, a, you know, a handful of artists just contend with me. They do not like me saying art is objective. They think I'm wrong. Well, it stems from this idea. It stems from this idea that, oh, no, art has no definition. It has no fixed meaning. It has no, um, you know, fixed place. You, you can't define art. There's no way. And I would say, no, you can define art. You can define music. And um, I'm sorry, Sir Duchamp, but I would I would disagree with you there. Let's continue. I don't believe in art. I believe in artist. Well, yeah, artist is a is is a person whose vocation is art. <laughs> I, I just get the sense it's tongue in cheek, but I, I could be wrong. To all appearances, the artist acts like a mediumistic being. Who, oh, I, I didn't say that correctly. Mediumistic. Mediumistic. Let me say that again. To all appearances, the artist acts like a mediumistic being who, from the labyrinth beyond time and space, seeks his way out to a clearing. Yeah, I can agree with that. I have forced myself to contradict myself in order to avoid in order to avoid conforming to my own taste. I I would really see nothing wrong with having your own taste as an artist, but that's just me. The individual, man as a man, man as a brain, if you like, interests me more than what he makes because I've noticed that most artists only repeat themselves. Now, first of all, I, I find, I find what people make to be much more interesting. <laughs> I like is that is that a really is that an honest thing for him to say like is are are people interesting? Yeah, yeah, they can be interesting. Um but but this kind of um uh I'm hearing a, a little bit of buzzing. One one second. Okay. I think I think it's something external upstairs. Um I wonder actually, let me, one sec guys. I, I just want to be sure it's um, nothing of my computer. One second here. And then I'll get back to what we were talking about.
Okay. Uh, I, so I, I, <laughs> let me let me stop the the screen share for a second. Um, thanks, guys, for waiting. Um, a little strange, but uh, I, I thought uh, at first I'm hearing this really kind of flute like whistle. And I think it might have to do with the my, my fridge, you know, of course, in the kitchen. But I, I was I was almost freaking out because I, I thought for a second I had tinnitus like like it, I, I felt like it was internal, like it was going in my head. I was like, what was, you know, coming from because it was it was coming from every you know room of my place. It's like maybe this is in my head. Um, so it's actually it is external. So I'm not quite sure w what might be the 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 little noise for it might be uh, might be a sign of a, a bad compressor i hope not <laughs> um but uh I, i'm good i don't have tinnitus so that's good so let's go back let's go back to what we were talking about um we were we were quoting Mar marcel duchamp thanks guys for waiting uh, on that uh, so we'll we'll cover a few artists and then we'll um we'll go back into to that so yeah let me share again and then then we'll go back to the chat Little, little little discombobulated right now. <laughs> All right, back to Duchamp. Okay, so so yeah, I was, he he's expressing interest in. I'm, I'm more interested in the man himself, not not what he creates. But it's like, but that that's kind of the beauty of art is you know the that that creation is what's embodying who he is. The the, the two are not separate. It's, it's kind of kind of strange um for, for him to say that um and but his reason is because i've noticed that artists only repeat themselves and it's like you know yes i do support the experimental i do support um uh i i do support people pushing their boundaries their their artistic boundaries that that just makes their art and their artistic journey all the more engaging, all the more interesting. So I I understand that from 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 his pers his perspective there. But it's it's I always feel like these contemporary these these artists of the twentieth century were always nitpicking, like they were so psychoanalytical. It's like, well, it's it's really it's really a separation of this. It's like actually the 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 two, you know, the 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 man and his art. They're that they're a part of each other. <laughs> there's no, there's no distinction. So anyway, that, that's just me, but um, we'll continue. Um, I don't remember actually reading this um, beforehand. So let's have fun. Art is paradoxical. It is, it's almost schizophrenic. On one side, I worked from a very intellectual form of activity. And on the other side, De deifying everything by more materialistic thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I, again, there's kind of this antithesis toward the deification of art, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't have art be my idol either. But and, you know, I, I could understand this to to some extent. When I discovered ready mades, I thought to discourage, uh, I thought to discourage aesthetics. In Neodata, they have taken my ready maids and found aesthetic beauty in them. I threw the bottle rack and the urinal into their faces as a challenge, and now they admire them for their aesthetic beauty. That's funny. That I, I find that funny. Um, yeah, no, like that, that's the frustration of some of these artists where it's like, no, no, you're not supposed to think of these as art. You're not supposed to think of this as beautiful. And and people actually do. I've I've seen this firsthand where 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 an artist is they their intent is to make something so ugly or so out of the norm. And then people like you'll see people cry because they think it's such a beautiful experience. It is and, and I can understand the frustration of those those contemporary artists. Like, no, you're not supposed to be moved. Uh, so, uh, the idea of repeating for me is a form. Oh, yeah, we're not going to read that. <laughs> I haven't read these uh, uh, ahead of time. I uh, probably should have. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay. Yeah, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll skip. Is this this? Uh, okay, this might be a safe one. I forgot. Uh, I forgot who I was, reading, you know, quoting. He he did have kind of more, uh, more abrasive 
uh, view of art in, in the way of erotica. Well, not erotica, but the erotic. I am still a victim of chess. It has all the beauty of art and much more. It cannot be commercialized. Chess is much purer than art in its so social position. All right. I think I think we'll stop quoting Marcel Duchamp. <laughs> all right. Let's uh, at least go to his summary. Maybe accomplishments, but definitely summary. Few artists can boast of having changed the course of art history in the way that Marcel Duchamp did. Really? I know, I probably, I, I, I'm not an art history buff myself, but I'm sure a lot of artists did change the course of artistic history or art history. By challenging the very notion of what art is, or, or the very notion of what is art, his first ready-mades sent shockwaves across the art world that can still be felt today. Duchamp's ongoing preoccupation with the mechanisms of desire and human sexuality, as well as his fondness for word wordplay, aligns his work with that of surrealists, although he steadfastly refused to be affiliated with any specific artistic movement per se. In his assistance that art should be driven by ideas above all, driven by ideas, I've talked about this, Duchamp is generally considered to be the father of conceptual art. His refusal to follow a conventional artistic path matched only by a horror of repetition, which accounts for the relatively small number of works Duchamp produced in the span of his short career, ultimately led to his withdrawal from the art world. In later years, Duchamp famously spent his time playing chess, even as he labored away in secret at his last enigmatic masterpiece which was only unveiled after his death. Now, I, I find this fascinating if this is true, because, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to poke fun at art and if you're going to express art in a very um, anti-art way or a very antithetical way, you're going to withdraw from art. You're, you're going to cease to be, become an artist. Why would you poke fun of the vocation? You know, I'm not saying that you have to be a zealot or be absolutely passionate about art 100% of your, your time on this earth. But, 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 but this idea of like, I'm going to question art, I'm going to challenge art, I'm going to be antithetical, I'm going to, I'm going to sneer at art. And then, then it says here, his refusal to follow the conventional path matched only by a horror of repetition, which accounts for the relatively small number of works he produced in the span of his short career. He ultimately, you know, withdrew from the art world. That's, that's very interesting. So he, he was not prolific in that he, uh, produced a lot of different pieces, and and he had um, he had disdain of repetition, and and what a what a conundrum for an artist to put put themselves in that position, uh, where it's like I hate repetition, I hate um, following a line of taste, I I don't want an artistic taste, I don't want an artistic signature, I don't want people to know me for this. I've got to be new every time. I've got to be novel every time. It's kind of this weird fascination and obsession of, of the novel, you know, the feeling of, of novel. And, um, I, I, I would just say to the artists out there, especially to the contemporary artists out there, just relax have fun. Artists, you know, art is supposed to be enjoyable. You know, this was, this was a sentiment. Um, I, I know by at least, you know, you know, one of my friends at, at college, you know, back in Seattle, where uh, there, you, you were supposed to, as an artist, you were supposed to go through this kind of martyrdom, like where art was supposed to be a, an ever grueling process. And I, I'm really glad I snapped out of that you know, with it, you know, pretty much after graduating with my master's, I snapped out of that. I was like, you know, I'll, I'll take, I'll take the tools I've learned. I'll take the, the, the compositional techniques that I've learned and the practices I've learned and I'll apply it to something that I can really enjoy. Um, so I kind of feel bad for people like Duchamp. I'm not, I'm not saying this in, in a, um, a, 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 in any way mocking him, um, but no, if you're going to be antithetical, if you're going to be against art as an artist, you're going to withdraw from it. That that's a natural course of events. That that that's cause and effect right there. Um, so pretty interesting, and, and 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 pretty interesting that he he was frustrated that people thought his his ready mates were supposed to be a thing of beauty. Um, I might yeah, we'll talk about his accomplishments. Uh. 
So the first the first thing is coined by Duchamp, the term ready-made came to designate mass-produced everyday objects taken out of their usual context and promoted to the status of artworks by mere choice of the artist. So his famous, his most famous ready-made is the urinal. It's it's mass produced, it's functional, it's it's for society. Um as good as indoor plumbing, it, it just needs to be there. Uh, but he wanted to to kind of scoff at the notion that, you know, that rather than an art piece of, of some craftsmanship or of some um, intrinsic value be, be placed on uh, on a pedestal, he wanted a, a urinal. No, I mean, the, the, obviously it's, 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 um, it's crude. It's a crude topic on its own, um, just how, you know, urinals function. But also, he, he wanted to put something that was easily replicated, that was easily mass produced. So in place of a very original, very special artwork is, is something that is mass produced, something that is no different from another thing. You know, it's one of thousands or millions. Concept is very interesting. Um, but again, it's it's kind of that um, kind of sinister idea of... Uh, I think it's kind of sinister. It's like, where I was like, ah, well, I don't like art. So therefore I'm going to make this my art piece. Uh, second point is Duchamp rejected purely visual or what he dubbed um, retinal pleasure, deeming it to be facile in favor of the more intellectual concept driven approaches to art making. And for that matter viewing, he remained committed, however, to study the per, uh, perspective and optics, which underpins his experiments with kinetic devices, reflecting an ongoing concern with the representation of motion in machines common to futurist and surrealist artists at the time. I find this good. I mean, I, I, I think I think art should be intellectual. And I think it should be concept driven. I do think it should be concept driven, but the concept, the idea took precedence. It, it took precedence over the art piece itself. Or as I say, no, have it be concept driven, have it be a great idea, but it must be executed well. And, and I think if you have that, you have your long lasting art piece. All right, I think, um, yeah, I think that, that'll be it for Duchamp. <laughs> um, and we are actually kind of going, um, well, we're, we're sort of getting into the 90 minute mark. So um, let's, I do want to read a couple more, maybe if, if just quotes and summaries. So let's get into uh, the biography of Francis Picabia, a French designer, uh, illustrator, painter, and writer, uh, born 1879, died in 1953. Artists, so they say, make fun of the bourgeoisie. Me, I make fun of the bourgeoisie and the artists. So it's kind of like he he he's mocking the mocker by 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 just uh, only doubling down on mockery. New York is the cubist, the futurist city. It expresses in its architecture, its life, its spirit, the modern thought. What I like, uh, what I like is to invent, to imagine, to make myself at every moment a new man and then to forget him, to forget everything. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, let, let's, let's accomplish all of this and then just throw it by the wayside and, and, and say it means nothing. Because it's very fascinating, right? It's a, it's a very fascinating concept. Each artist is a mold. I aspire to be many. One day I'd like to write on the wall of my house artists in all genres. It's very strange. Like he, he, he wants to, re, you know, reduce the artist to nothing, but at the same time, he wants to be all kinds of artists as well. The world is divided into two categories, failures and unknowns. That, that's a very myopic view of the world. But again, it's it's a reaction to the Great War. Only useless things are indispensable. I, I, I can see that, but I have to think a little bit more deeply before I agree. If you want to have clean ideas, change them as often as you change your shirt. Um, uh, Picabia's career is a kaleidoscope series of art experiences. So I'll just read his summary. Uh, once known as Papa Dada, Francis Pacabia is one of the principal figures of the Dada movement, both in Paris and New York. A friend and associate of Marcel Duchamp, 
Uh, he became known for a rich variety of work ranging from strange comic erotic images of machine parts to text-based paintings that foreshadow aspects of conceptual art. Even Dada, even after Dada had been supplanted by other styles, the French painter and writer went on to explore a diverse and almost incoherent mix of styles. Well, that makes sense if it's diverse and incoherent. <laughs> he shifted easily from uh, uh, he shifted easily between abstraction and figuration at a time when artists clung steadfastly to one approach and his gleeful disregard for convention of modern art encouraged some remarkable in innovations even later in his career from the layered uh, transparency series of the 1920s to the kitsch erotic nudes of the early 1940s. Bukabia remained revered by contemporary painters as one of the century's most intriguing and inscrutable artists. So, um, yeah, again, the idea of um, really having disdain for artists who stick to one taste or or one approach, and and to that I say, okay, if you don't if you don't like it, don't do it, but don't have disdain for it, you know. Well, what's the, what's with the you know disdain? <laughs> That's what I say. Um, should we read his accomplishments? That's a lot. I don't feel like it. You guys can read it. <laughs> Um, all right. Yeah. Raul Hausman. Yeah. He's, he's pretty important, at least in, in my um, experience. Um, Raul Hausman, uh, um, Austrian sculptor, photographer, and writer born in 1886, died in 1971. Um, all right. I do want to go through these quotes too. I, I love reading these quotes. I hope you guys don't mind. Seeing is an enchanted process, and the transformation of this process in art is conjuring, transfixing magic. In early times of humanity, the representation of man's environment was not naturalism, simply reproduction, rather man's total relations to and perceptions of the world and the power stirring within them were symbolically and magically grasped, condensed, and transfixed. So, you know, this, this, this notion of I have to explore outside the simplicity which I, I can understand. To be a photographer is to become aware of visible appearances and at the same time acquire from them an education in individual and common optical per perception. Why? Because every individual sees in his own way, but sees little more than images shaped by cultural standards of a given period. That's, that's pretty insightful. I'll, I'll give him credit for that. What is... Important is that our optical awareness rids itself of classical notions of beauty and opens itself more and more to the beauty of the instant and of the uh, of these surprising points of view that appear for a brief moment and never return. Those are what make photography and art. Now, this is kind of that sentiment of fluxus where it's about the moment. It's about the ephemeral. It's about seeing beauty in, in something instantaneous in your everyday life. Now, again, that, that can work really well in, in the art world. What I appreciate with Raul Hausman is that he captured it. He's he's archived it as a photographer. Now I I I I would say there's kind of this uh, dichotomy happening happening. Actually, no, I would I would say dichotomy. I'll I'll say juxtaposition where, you know, on the one hand, there's this disdain for beauty among these movements, but then on the other hand, there's this this need to expand beauty. It's like, well, I don't like, I don't like the beautiful. Oh, no, no, no. We got to actually make the beautiful have um, a different meaning. We have to expand the meaning of beauty. It's a, it's a very strange thing. It's like, well, if you embrace the ugly, but, but also know that there are definitive lines of what beauty is. Oh, this looks, <sighs> I might skip this. <laughs> I just want to read the shorter quotes. It is no longer possible to construct phonetic poetry in classical typography according to the rules of symmetry. This was a necessary step which had to accompany uh, the, the, the conception of noise, uh, emanations of unregulated tones, which no longer submitted to the well-tempered clavier. Uh, asymmetry, a asymmetry was an, an un un unavoidable uh, consequence. So what he's talking about is um, um, printed poems that really do elevate the sound, the, the structure of the word, the sound of the word, what it's supposed to sound like, uh, bits of words, um, kind of the obliteration of words and, and the deconstruction 
of uh, you know vowels and not 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 um, I mean I meant to say deconstruction of words in in phonemes. You know how how words are constructed in phonemes and syllables, and he was very famous to to as a photographer, an illustrator to to have that um, uh, topography where or, or yeah topography where he is showing these um interesting uh these pictures of sounds now i wonder if i i didn't check out yeah this was this was a famous one uh this one right here um it's it's just printed L let me read this one this this is pretty um important of him and kurt schwitters i probably won't go into his um accomplishments but this one right here um, I don't know if it's titled BBBB or B -B -B -B. um, but it's, it's all to do with his phonetic poetry. So Hausman's phonetic poetry was designed to be read and performed featuring letters and punctuation marks in an arrangement that forms a picture rather than a poem. So the letters and punctuation marks are, are fo forming the picture itself, not a poem to be uh, semantic or, or to have um, any grammatical syntax or prose rather um, his formations that do not create words or sentences but which still might be spoken or uttered resemble rather small insects crawling in different directions and in different formations across the white page the letters are not arbitrarily placed however there is a vague meandering uh, shape that leads our eyes ultimately down to the horizontal line of letters at the bottom of the page oh no oh 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 oh, oh ooh, mm. <laughs> So actually that 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 before reading on um the phonetic poetry actually really helped my own contemporary idea um a contemporary practice of extended technique for voice so where you go like that you know just that would be part of your performance the interplay between text and sounds opens up the opportunity for uh, a synesthetic experience if one sees them in an innate rhythm totally totally plausible there. The phonetic poem also prompts the more meditative viewer and reader uh, to consider the nature of semantics and the arbitrary relationship between words and their meanings or lack of. Now, I, I don't philosophically agree with the deconstruction of meanings and, and words. I do. I know it's often contended with, but I do believe that words have definitive meaning. They have fixed meaning. But in terms of interesting and engaging performances, yeah, the, the breaking down of phonemes and syllables and, and punctuation is, is quite engaging as a performer. So that that's one of it. He, he's also done a lot of um, other interesting, visually interesting pieces. Okay. Um, I think we'll read one more quote of his and then we'll stop there. Maybe not. <laughs> um, naive anthrop anthropomorphism has played out its role. The beauty of our daily life is defined by the mannequins, the wig making skills of the hairdressers, the exactness of the technical construction. We strive anew toward conformity with the mechanical work process. We will have to get used to the idea of seeing our originating in the factories. So that really does sum up Dada, Dadaism, where the, their disdain for conventional beauty really actually comes from a disdain for the 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 um, in, industrial age. You know, the 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 the, the machines taking over, the, the mass production of um, materials, um, just kind of the careless treatment of nature. Understandable. It's it's very reactionary, but it's it's an understandable concern, uh, and 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 that their reaction was, of course, to mock that. So I find that pretty interesting. Ah, I've been looking for for this word for a long time. I will read the summary. Thanks, guys, for letting me indulge. I I, I do find this fascinating. Ah, there are two more authors I want to talk about, but uh, I might actually take a break. We might, after after reading Raoul Hausman's summary, we might take a break, go back to chat, and then go back to two more, two more artists, because I, I think they're pretty important. One of the founders of Berlin Dada, Hausman is credited with formulating the technique of photomontage with his uh, companion Hannah Hoch, I think is, is how the surname goes. I could be wrong with my German pronunciation. 
Uh, he devised a cut and paste anti-art strategy that was nothing short of an affront to the aesthetic and um, ideological standards that had come to define earlier and current avant-garde movements. So actually this was an antithetical to avant-garde movements. That's, that's fascinating. Not so much classical beauty or classicism. Classicism. Yes, classics. In Berlin, Dada's attempt to um, in Berlin, Stada attempts to build a new aesthetic code for a shell-shocked post-war German society. His output extended to assemblage, uh, assemblage, sorry, assemblage, uh, experiments in sound poetry and polemical writing. So, so taking bits of newspaper, for instance, and, and pasting it in a, in a form of art. After the demise of the group, Hausmann effectively reinvented himself in the dual role of fine art photographer and painter, and as the would-be inventor of the ambitious sound image conversion machine, he named the op optophone. So, um, yeah, he I, I, and I think the optophone, if I remember correctly, is is a way to artistically convey the sound. So, like, um, you know, b -b 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 would actually be be seen printed as an artistic kind of bubble or or cloud, you know, to really depict um, a, 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 an artistic symbol of the, the phonem or the, or the letter. Uh, I, I kind of find that pretty engaging, to be honest. All right, let's go ahead and, and we'll stop our screen share. Um, let me get into the, this page here. Yeah, yeah, Hugo Ball. Hugo Ball is important, and then Kurt Schwitters, and then we'll, we'll, we'll be done. And fortunately, Hugo Ball only has one quote, and I think I even quoted it, so we don't even have to go through those quotes. Thanks, guys. We'll see how uh, um, you guys are handling it. You guys getting bored yet? <laughs> That's all right. All right. Yes, that's right. Yes, Big Al, thank you for that reference. The id can kill if backed by alien tech a la Forbidden Planet. Yes, that 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 is a very good reference to the id. Wonderful. So artistically done. What, what a wonderful film. So good. It, it's a good film. Final Fantasy. Uh, 12. Iris is one big story being told into songs. Will Ryan, the music artist behind this, draws from his life as a content creator in Isis. Or, I said Isis. I, I meant to say Iris. Hopefully the the the, the uh, stream doesn't shut down. Um, it is coming out uh, with the book. The songs aren't going to be in the book because Iris is very serious to be on the corny side. Um, oh, on the corny side of being a musical. A few hours later. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I know I probably should have put my music in the background while, while we were fi fixing that. Yeah, it was, it was, it was kind of like this like war warbling sign tone I was hearing. And I it was high pitched. It was it was like going between frequencies. And, and I understand that high pitch with tinnitus can actually fluctuate between frequencies. Now, I, I wasn't hearing it in one ear. I was actually he hearing it in both ears, which actually would be a, a, a better way of having tinnitus than to have it in one ear. But I, I heard ringing and I just, I didn't know where, where that was coming from. R says the, the, the fountain art is disgusting, but oddly beautiful. Yeah. And I think, I think Duchamp based on his quotes, he didn't, he didn't like that. He didn't like it to be taken as, as something beautiful, but that's, see, see that that's the beautiful thing. See that I I've been saying this, this is proof, du, you know, Duchamp, uh, Marcel Duchamp is, is proof of what I've been saying these, these past weeks is, that you don't have to worry about narcissism as an artist. You don't, you don't have to worry about ego because people are going to interpret your art in ways you don't want them to interpret. You know, it's like, oh, you're not supposed to see this as beautiful. Sorry. You know, people are going to see. People are going to see it as beautiful. So I, I that that's pretty funny. So got a little hair sticking out. I wonder what that's about. <clears throat> that almost sounded like beatboxing sound, Graver. Um, actually, Elijah, I, I I used to practice beatboxing, but I haven't done it in in years. And um, 
Uh, my lips are really dry right now. <laughs> I'm not going to I'm not gonna try it live. But yeah, I, I used to have a pretty good, pretty good kick. Pretty good kick. Um, all right. So we'll talk about two more artists and then we will, uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Cause I actually probably want to do one or two artistic things tonight before going to bed. We'll see. <laughs> all right. So let's go ahead and, um, start with Hugo Ball. Maybe summary, maybe a couple things, and then uh, Kurt Schwitters, which I will talk about. All right, uh, so summary of Hugo Ball. Oh, it's a, it's a rather big summary, but I think it's important. Uh, Hugo Ball's major co uh, contribution as leader and co-founder, along with his girlfriend, cabaret performer Emmy Hennings of the Dada Movement, was to articulate articulate the collective's radical nihilistic and iconoclastic ideology. This was the first group in Zurich uh, that spawned important international offshoots in Paris, Berlin, and New York. In their first Dadaist manifesto written by Ball in 1916, the early Dadaists who met at the Cabaret Voltaire explained how their new movement was a direct revolt against the prevailing bourgeois aesthetic and social values of the West, always the West under attack, and against society's glorification of war and violence. As I said before, reactionary. Not blaming them. Total natural. Totally natural. Ball's sound poems, such as Karwani, uh, 1916, and Katzen and Huen, 1916, exemplified Dada's ironic, nonsensical, and playful yet deadly serious. Playful yet deadly serious. Where, where have we heard this before? Fluxus. Playfully a deadly serious critique of Western culture. It's always Western culture. They net did they ever um did they ever go against the beauty of, of Japanese architecture? Probably not. Not that I've heard of anyway. A prolific writer and well educated in German history, philosophy, and literature, Ball also drafted a number of other experimental writings, including a novel, an extensive diary, and several scholarly works. By 1920, Ball returned to the, to the Catholicism of his early life and immersed himself in the mysticism of early medieval Christian saints. He retired with Hennings to a tiny Swiss village, Gnuzzo, where he began the process of revising, uh, revising his diaries from 1910 to 1921, where he were later published under the title Die Flucht aus der Zeit. I don't know if my German pronunciation is all that good. Flight out of time. The diaries um, provided uh, provide a wealth of let me say this again. The diaries provide a wealth of information concerning the people and um, events of the Zurich Dada movement. Ball died quite young at the age of forty one in nineteen twenty seven. Poor, a poor, uh, poor, a religious zealot in self imposed isolation and all but forgotten. He became the epitome of the Dadaists as once he described them, a person still so convinced of the unity of all beings, the totality of all things, that he suffers from the dissonances. So I won't go into um, his work, but, um, but, but we didn't see that signature piece, uh, Karwani, and, and, and the picture of him there. Pretty interesting guy. Oh, and then finally, Kurt Schwitters. This is the guy I learned about. German painter, collagist, and writer. And I think his quotes are short, so don't worry about that. <laughs> Art is a primordial concept, exalted as the Godhead, inexplicable as life, in indefinable, and without purpose. So he's, he's, ca he's causing that contradiction, like it's supposed to be deified, and then it's supposed to be without purpose. Merz means to create connections, preferably between everything in this world. In the war at the machinery factory at Wolfen, I discovered my love for the wheel and recognized that machines are abstractions of the human spirit. Merz stands for the freedom from all fetters, uh, for the sake of artistic creation. Freedom is not a lack of restraint. Uh, freedom is not a lack of restraint, but the product of strict artistic discipline. I actually agree with that. Um, you, you do find yourself really 
breaking out of your artistic mold when you set strict parameters in your um, creative process. The artist creates by choosing, distributing, and reshaping the materials. Uh, all right. So um, I think we'll, we'll let's see. If the, would this be fine? Uh, yeah, Our, any desire to reproduce natural forms limits the force and, consist, and consistency of working out an expression. I, I do believe form follows function and art is the embodiment of the natural and of the spiritual. But I can see his sentiments. I can understand them. The picture is a self-sufficient work of art. It is not connected to anything outside. So I, idea of disconnection or things not relating to one another. I'm actually going to uh, read his summary, and then I'm going to talk about one piece that um, is pretty, pretty interesting. And then we'll wrap it up. Summary of Kurt Schwitters. Directly affected by the depressed state of Germany following World War I and the modernist ethos of the Dada movement, Kurt Schwitters began to collect garbage from the streets and incorporate it directly into his artwork. The resulting collages were characterized by their especially harmonious sentimental arrangements and their incorporation of printed media. So he was, he, he, he's taking the, the, the products of mass production uh, or, or mass consumerism, things like, you know, shirt buttons or shoelaces or something like that. Um, as an example, he's trying to find the artistic beauty of those things rather than, um, uh, a thing separate to reality. He actively produced artistic journals, illustrated works and advertisements, as well as founding his own Mertz journal. He wrote poems and musical works that played with letters, kind of like what we saw with um, Houseman, uh, lacing them together in unusual combinations as he had done in his collages in, in the hope of encouraging his audience to find their own meanings. So a little bit into the getting into that structuralism, post-structuralism idea. Um, his multiple avant-garde efforts culminated in his large um, Merzbau crea creations. These works collected, um, these works, collaborations with other avant-garde artists would start with one object to which others were added, causing the whole piece to change and evolve over time, growing to great proportions that forced the viewer to actually experience rather than simply view the art. So that definitely, of course, goes in, uh, you know, from the 1920s all the way into the 1950s and 60s and 70s with the Fluxus movement. Uh, so that, that's pretty interesting. Now, um, uh, he, he's got some accomplishments. Uh, I, I want to actually talk about just just one. Um, as it was important to to just have the, the phonetic sounds in the poetry with, with, with Hausman. Uh, Kurt Schwitters actually did a pretty interesting... Uh, a sound collage, a piece called Urzenate. Um, and let's actually, uh, actually, I have it here. Um, I, I won't, of course, play it, obviously, but, um, uh, well, I gotta, oh, did I not share that screen? Okay, well, there you go. Hopefully you were listening to what I was saying, and not just reading. <laughs> It's a little discombobulated stream, but that's okay because it's data. This whole stream is data. <laughs> um, but anyway, I'm going to share this video here. Uh, Urzenate, right here. So Urzenate, uh, this is a great recording. I'm going to actually uh, uh, copy the the YouTube video. I, I remember being impacted by it, you know, several years ago, and. Um, it, it, it's about a, this performance is 17 minutes. It, it could go longer, it could go shorter, but he speaks these, these nonsensical, uh, nonsensical syllables um, really, really, really fast. Um, and he's, he's very good. So it's, it's a very absurd performance, but this, this performer, Michael Schmidt, I think uh, he, 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 the performance is really inspiring. It's really, really well done. So if you want um, a Dada performance piece that is excellently done, um, this one right here, um, Urzenate. Um, Urzenate, I think, is, is a play on words like resonate. And it's all about just achieving 
kind of a musical variety with with the mouth sounds and with the with the different syllables. Uh, there's an old old recording I think in in the 1930s that it, it's just not as dynamic. It's it's not as good as this video. Um, so if you are interested in seeing a a, a Dada piece, uh, Kurt Schwitter's Erzenate is pretty much the best one out there that I've seen. So um, I will stop sharing, and um, I think that's it. I think I think we covered Dada. I, I wanted to cover Neo Dada, but I was like, well, there's, there, there are things I want to talk about. So it, we're really going up to the two hour mark uh, with 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 some minor interruptions, and that's okay. So, um, all right. Uh, Final Fantasy fan says, as the saying goes, and this is the point of Iris, art is in the eye of the beholder. It is in the eye of the beholder. The 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 that that's what that's that's the one thing that makes art subjective is actually the experience of the viewer. But I would say art is also objective. So um, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> uh interesting elijah says uh yeah they seem to love to hate western culture but don't say much about other cultures yeah it's like okay I, in in the dadaists defense you know they were talking about the they, they wanted to bring down western culture because the because of the bureaucracy that that caused all the nations to collide into this catastrophic war so i i'm i want to i always want to come from a place of grace with this kind of sentiment because you're you're point of view in the 1920s is it's going to be a little different from your point of view in the 2020s um we're, we're just trying to fight and uphold the goodness that we have here so we don't have to go back into what they faced in the 1920s um but uh yeah so uh, but 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 you know for world war ii however if if that if that mindset continued would they say anything negative about the Japanese? There have been a lot. Of, there, there have been instances where I've seen um, uh, artists depict the horrors of Hiroshima, you know, and and how bad that was. And of course, it was catastrophic. Um, and I'm not, I'm not lessening that. But, but it's like, what about Pearl Harbor? You know, we were attacked. <laughs> you know, um, what about the depiction of of that? And and so I, I find. I find that this like this tearing down of the West is like, yes, I, I get it. That that's a reaction to the Great War, no question. But but it, it it's continuing a hundred years later. It's continuing, and and we haven't experienced world wars, world wars, and in, in in our lifetime, you know, people, you know, people are, el you know, they're they're elderly. That those who um you know vividly remember you know World War Two. Like, yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, Dr. Y says, depressed artist, Germany post -war World War One. Not good, not good, not good, not good. A depressed artist started World War II. Oh, Ooh. <laughs> I know that reference. So um, anyway, so um, actually, uh, Team Ghost, I, I I actually forgot the initial um, start of the word Dada. It, it's supposed to represent nonsensical, but I actually think it came. It came. I feel like it came from an actual country in the world, meaning something. But I, I actually didn't do my research. Um, but Dada is supposed to be that 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 you know like nonsensical blah, that 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 like. So if you actually looked into old archives of of Dada sound poetry you would hear that you would hear ugliness of, of you know syll syllabic ugliness that that's supposed to sound like you're, you're an infant you're, you're you're nonsensical um so so dada is is kind of that representation da 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 you know something like that anyway i feel like i need to talk about something um just just closing we're we're, we're, we're closing we're, we're at the two hour mark um what was I going to say? <laughs> I feel so discombobulated tonight. Um, or dis disoriented, I, I would say is a better word. Um, just look, be on the lookout for some Super Clatter videos uh, this Thursday. And um, 
maybe, maybe some more commentary. I'm trying to I'm trying to do like a super collider video on Thursdays and then two commentary videos following, you know, just from the stream. Um, we're getting into close to Thanksgiving. Um, Prof and I are going to do something for, for Thanksgiving, like a Thanksgiving stream. Uh, we don't know the date yet, but we'll, we'll do something together. And um, and that would be on his channel. Um, we also have the book studies at over at Catholic Bible Geek uh, with with Big Al. Uh, we're doing Two Towers Tuesday night at 10, um, 10 p.m. Eastern time. And then uh, over at the Prof's channel, uh, The Allegiance, the Star Wars EU uh, book study of that book, The Allegiance, over at his yeah, Prof channel at 10, P Professor Geek. Um, what else do I want to say? I don't know. I need to get back into um, some some game soundtracks and 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 maybe uh, doing some um, you know easy analysis over you know uh, of like the game I'm playing right now is Final Fantasy IV and and enjoying the music there. So maybe some uh, gaming analysis. I need to actually do fixed videos and and continue on with my DKC series. I might do that getting into September or uh, September <laughs> December. And, um, so, so kind of be on the lookout in the next month or two with, with some, some gaming commentary and, and, and composition commentary there. Um, some, some evaluation and assessment. Um, if I find another art movement that is pretty important, you know, to talk about the philosophy of, 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 um, you know, people, you know, artists mocking, uh, the culture and the climate and all that. You know, if, if I find that there are, are philosophies that are related to what we see in, in the mystery, the mistreatment of our popular franchises, then then I'll then I'll continue talking about our art movement. Um, but if I have something else to say next week, it'll probably be different too. But yeah, thanks guys for indulging um, on, on on the at least the past three weeks on on the different art movements. I think it's really important for artists to be aware of just the sentiment of disdain and 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 nihilism and and, and these kind of um, propensities to to be cynical, to be sardonic, and stuff like that, and and why we see this in in the elite popular art uh, of our time. So um, anyway, so I actually don't know quite what the topic is going to be next next week, but it might be more art, or it might be some commentary. I might talk about why I don't need to watch the new Star Wars because I do have that on my mind as well. But until I see you next, you guys, I do hope you continue preserving and producing the art you love. And thanks again, always. I will see you in, in the other chats of the other streams. Take care. <laughs>